Hello, everybody. Welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Delighted to have you on board, of course. Welcome to one of our educational videos for a series, a certificate called WSET Diploma. And we're here looking at a standalone single video on the region of Navarra in northern Spain, Basque area of Spain. As always, any comments, any questions, pop them in the comment section below. Always great to hear from you. Let's start talking about this wonderful landscape. Uh, the picture, first of all, actually, is the Mesa de los Reyes, which is the highest peak here in Navarra, where in the past, in historical sense, the rulers of Navarra, Aragon, and the Vicant of Bern, which is up in France, would meet with a view of their respective kingdoms to discuss and of course, rule. So let's have a look at the landscape of Navarra. Where are we looking? So the autonomous community of Navarra is situated directly to the northeast uh, of La Rioja. So if you have done the Rioja section, of course, you will know a lot about this already, as I've discussed that border before. So you'll see that just here. Of course, it's right next to the Pius Vasco. It borders France with the Pyrenees being the dominating geographical feature here. And then, of course, the large area of Aragon is to its east. Now, the Dio of the uh, Navarra is this kind of shaded area south of Pamplona on the border of Aragon and on, of course, La Rioja. Uh, so it's a shaded area because as we go north, it becomes far too mountainous. So it covers about uh, half just under of Navarra and there's around 11,000 hectares undivine in this region. We're going to go through some history before we go through things like climate, uh, topography, geology, and then, of course, key styles that we find here. First of all, though, our historical view. So in this area, uh, pre-Roman times, we would have a tribe called the Vascones, uh, a Basque tribe. Then we have Romans, uh, and the mountains kept the Romans out of northern Navarra, too much to handle, and they occupied the southern areas around the Ebro River for better transport and, of course, better agricultural means uh, and that their area. That's a bridge you'll see here, which is over the Arga River in Punente la Riena, which is just to the southwest of Pamplona, kind of in our central, central northern part of Navarra. We then, of course, have the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire collapsing, and we have the Visigoths and Franks coming through this area. The local tribe, the Vasconis, the Basque, as they were now known, defended the homeland against each of these quite successfully. The Moors, of course, started to rampage their way through the Iberian Peninsula in the early 8th century. But their presence here was weak and they never completely took a hold of this landscape. What they actually did occupy was actually quite peaceful. Then we have Christian kingdoms emerging in 824 AD. The first king of Pamplona, uh, who has significant power struggles with the Moors, uh, is uh, established. And the alliance with Castile helps to eventually expel the Moors and push them south in the 11th century. There are then ensuing conflicts with Castile and eventually lost the Basque territories in 13th centuries, the Christians, that is. <clears throat> we have monasteries. Of course, during the Middle Ages, uh, we have an emergence of the Christian church. We have the 9th and 10th century monasteries emerging, producing, of course, wine for sacramental purposes. And, of course, for the thirsty pilgrims who were traversing the Camino de Santiago, also covered in the Rioja and Castilla e Leon sections. The monastery picture you see here is of San Salvador in the 9th century. This was established, but of course, further uh, replenished since then. But of course, lots of wine production to suit this famous way of St. James and all the emerging monasteries. 
Um, then in the 15th century, we have a number of conflicts. Um, the area of Navarra becomes a part of Castile for the next four centuries. The Carlist Wars of the 19th centuries, where we have followers of the self-proclaimed King Carlos V, the younger brother, man, uh, <coughs> brother of Ferdinand VII, uh, creates uh, a lot of political instability here. And of course, then getting into the 20th century, we have Franco, General Franco. Pamplona was the central point for Franco's rebellion against the Republic during the Civil War, the Spanish Civil War of the 30s. <clears throat> we then have more modern times. Um, Phylloxera, of course, starts to spread its way through Europe. And the region was called upon to provide wine for the French uh, because it needed to fill the lack of wine being produced. La Rioja, Aragon, Navarra, Catalonia, all of these places really stuck up, stood up to the plate uh, to make sure there was wine being fed up, uh, fed into this new market of France, of course. But of course, coming the other way, lots of French winemakers made their way down here because, of course, they didn't have anything to do. I'm sure they did. But of course, nothing anywhere to what they previously would have to do. So um, many of the area at that time was replanted to Garnacha. Of course, that leads up to um, really around the 1970s, 80s, when Garnacha still leads the way ahead of Tempranillo. So um, here we have the climate of Navarra. Now, its location and size means that there are many climatic influences, including both the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, then we've got mountain effects. Of course, we don't see much uh, vineyard land up here in the north because of the Montes Vasco and also the Pyrenees, the Pyrenees that we find up there. But the DO does have five subzones, and primarily across this whole area, we are looking at being continental. But there is a division with three of the subzones, which I have identified there Val de Zarbe, Tierra Estella, and Baja Montaña. You have uh, the northern ones, basically. Uh, these are the cooler and wetter areas with influences from the Atlantic in the northwest uh, and also from the Pyrenees in the northeast. And of course, you're going to get generally longer growing seasons and more elegant wine produced in that section. Conversely, to the southern part here, the Ribera Alta and the Ribera Baja in the south is progressively warmer, drier, and flatter as it heads towards the Ebro and crosses the Ebro River, for example. So the Alta being above Ebro, the Baja being below it. Here is a map to show the topography. So we have, as mentioned previously, the Montes Vascos, which is the real sort of uh, um, far eastern point of the Cantabrian mountain range as it heads into the Pyrenees. Uh, and then we finally have the Pyrenees up here as well. So it's quite exaggeratedly topographical up there. Lots and lots of mountains. In the southern section, though, it's much flatter. And that's because we have a river that creates a border with La Rioja here and then runs through the southern section of, of course, the Ribiera Baja of Navarra. This is the Ebro River running from west to east. Uh, many smaller rivers run into this. We have the Ega, the Arga, and also the Aragon uh, River running through it. That's the one just over here, as you see, coming from Aragon, uh, coming into the Ebro River. There's also a wind that comes here, which is a north-northwest wind called the Gietho wind, and that blows through places like Rioja, Navarra, Aragon, and Catalonia, typically in autumn and winter. Geology that we find here, um, the letter A is to symbolize the alluvial soils found around all of those rivers like the Ega, Arga and the Aragon. The clay soils are found around the Ebro River Basin and limestone is found right in the south towards the Sierra de la Demanda. Now that's all interspersed with things like loam, marls and sands as well across the Ebro River Basin. 
Great varieties in play in Navarra. These are 2020 figures. And when we compare Navarra to other Spanish regions, there's actually quite a bit of nice diversity within Navarra. Certainly, if you're going to draw the direct comparison to the uh, neighbor to the south of the Ebro River, of course, La Rioja. La Rioja has, you know, a whopping amount of Tempranillo at its core. Tempranillo is the major grape variety still leading the way in Navarra, but with just around a third, whereas called La Rioja is 80% plus. Garnacha is around a quarter of the plantations. Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot combined around a quarter as well. So they're the leading four varieties, all red. And then we have Chardonnay and Viura combined at around one out of 10 of the plantations. So as mentioned, uh, Tempranillo is a little bit like in uh, uh, La Rioja, where it's become a bit more of a recent phenomenon. Garnacha was always the key grape variety here, as it was in Rioja as well. And it was really used here for a lot of deep colored rosés. It is still today, but quite significantly so beforehand. Uh, so on the back of government funded research programs in the 70s, the DO took this information and promoted red wines more from Tempranillo, hence why this is now the, the leading grape variety. Uh, and uh, later in the 80s, the Consejo Regulador here also uh, started to extol the virtues of Chardonnay, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon as well. Hence why they now form three of the top five. Red wines here then. So of the varieties mentioned, Tempranillo is often made as a single varietal, as you see in the label on the screen whereas Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are usually part of a red blend with Tempranillo and sometimes Garnacha. Uh, a range of styles are made. Uh, Nevada is quite well known for making quite fresh, fruity, light bodied, early drinking red wines. But then, of course, it actually has fairly great uh, knowledge for the more full bodied, concentrated wines, which are matured in oak barrels and can represent the categories of Crianza, like the label here, Reserva and Gran Reserva. French oak, yes, it's used. It borders France. American oak, of course, as well. Uh, but French is typical more for Cabernet and Merlot, and then American more typical for Tempranillo. White wines are a thing here too. Chivite, of course, you'll know of. Uh, Chardonnay is the principal white grape variety that tends to show citrus, peach, medium alcohol, medium to medium plus acidity. They're, they're generally quite ripe, quite flavor forward uh, with some good acidity. And there are unoaked and oaked expressions. You'll also find Sauvignon Blanc, Malvasia, Viura, and also Moscatel de Grano Menudo as well, which is Muscat Blanc. A petit gram. Rosés are well worth talking about. Our pink wines, we find here a significant volume of medium to deep coloured pink wines. They are dry and they are typically produced from Garnacha, sometimes a blend with Tempranillo, Cabernet and Merlot. And the grapes are sourced mainly from the cooler, more northerly areas of the region. Now, one key thing to immediately mention is the second point down there. Navarra Dio wines that are pink must be made from a short maceration on the skins. Uh, so therefore not the direct pressing method. The maceration will last typically for somewhere like three to four hours for the paler colored styles. And then something like the bottle you see there on the slide, six to 12 hours. Most of the pink wine is fermented in steel and then bottled quite soon thereafter to retain, of course, its primary juicy fruitiness. And of course, you will find some, though, that are in oak as well. A, a quick mention here as well for the Vinos de Pago that you find in Nevada, three of them. Uh, you've got Otazu, Irache, and Irenzano. 
The first one, uh, so the numbers you'll see here, so there's one close, uh, Pago de Atazu is close to Pamplona, and then in the Tierra Estella, you find the second two, so Irache and Arenzano, so three Pagos. Uh, Atazu the, is Spain's most northerly uh, Vino do Pago. It's generally Tempranillo, Cabernet, Merlots, and some Chardonnay. Irache, that is um, uh, classically uh, one that originates around a wine fountain for pilgrims, only making reds today. Tempranillo, Cabernet, Merlot, Graziano, Mathuelo, and Garnacha. And then Arenzano was the first ever Venus de Pago in Navarro. That is Cabernet, Tempranillo, Merlot, and Chardonnay. What is the future then for Navarra? Well, there are lots of different views, of course, as one would expect, and they are mixed on whether such diversity in Navarra is a benefit or whether Navarra should focus on a signature grape variety like its sister region across the Ebro, La Rioja. A number of critics, wine enthusiasts, educators, feel that Garnacha is the grape with the highest quality potential in Navarra, especially because of the onslaught of climate change and especially because of the amount of old bush vines that one can find for Garnacha. Uh, when it's made as a single varietal, Garnacha can be lighter bodied with red berry fruit, decent acidities, often actually quite high when we're looking at the Baja Montaña, the Val de Zarbe and the Tierra Estella, and then if you go south, it's made in that generally quite fuller, almost jammier expression. Overall, the wines of Navarra are good to very good with a few outstanding examples. And without having the same prestige as the DOCA wines of Rioja and Ribera del Duero, the prices tend to be inexpensive, mid-priced and with a few premium examples. Look out for, of course, Chivite. And also Lupier, though they may have um, uh, ceased production of late, but they make really wonderful wines or did make wonderful wines from exceptionally old vines, typically around uh, sort of 80 to 130 year old uh, and uh, exceptional wines as well. OK, that brings me to the end of Navarra. Thank you so much for following on. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you do have any comments, questions or concerns, please do get in touch. You can do so by commenting on this video below. Make sure you click like and you click subscribe whilst you are down there. Please do go visit the also the, uh, the portal. That's www.winewithjimmy.com because lots of exclusive video content, uh, lots of extra additional resources to help you with your wine studies. Uh, so lots of things to help you. But thank you so much. I've been Jimmy Smith. See you very soon. Ciao for now. Bye bye.